in the uh, in translation lecture series here in Tahrir. We have one more remaining at the new campus for those of you who can actually join us in New Cairo. Our final lecture there in the interdisciplinary lecture series is going to be by Ahmed Lattar and uh, who is a theater director, playwright, and translator. Um, and he will be speaking about uh, Beyond the Text, Theatrical Translation in the Age of Globalization. And this will be on Monday, May 9th. Um, so if you can join us, that would be uh, wonderful. Before I um, introduce our speaker this evening, I will ask you to please turn off your phones so that he is not interrupted uh, during the lecture. Thank you. Um, it's a unique pleasure, actually, to be hosting uh, Mohammed Taufi here this evening. We were together last night at a roundtable discussion that was actually quite wonderful about uh, thrillers. Uh, and uh, Mohammed was also participating uh, in the roundtable. It was quite, you know, fascinating to hear what the writers of thrillers had to say about the genre. Um, Mohammed Taufi was born in Cairo. He is a fascinatingly complex um, uh, profile, actually. Uh, he holds degrees in engineering from Cairo University, international law from the University of Paris, uh, diplomacy from the Egyptian Institute of Diplomatic Studies, and international relations from the Institut International d'Administration Publique in Paris. Um, he has pursued careers in engineering, uh, diplomacy, and writing that have taken him to numerous countries in Europe, Africa, the Americas, etc. Uh, from September 2012 to August 2015, a period of profound transformation in the history of Egypt, as we all know and continue to witness every day. Um, Hamad Taufi served as Egypt's ambassador to the United States. Since then, <laughs> and I guess it was that that did it, you know, um, he has decided to dedicate all his time to writing, which is, a, I think, a wise decision given this historical juncture. Um, Hamad Taufi has published in Arabic three volumes of short stories, The White Butterflies, uh, Till the Break of Dawn, and Agamist, Agamist um, an English translation of selected stories from these three volumes, was published in Egypt uh, under the title The Day the Moon Fell uh, in 1998. He is um, perhaps best known for his trilogy, uh, a Night in the Life of Abdel Taweb Tutu, uh, A Naughty Boy Called Antar, and Candy Girl. Together they form an epic work that follows Egypt's political and social evolution through the 20th century and the, well into the tw to 21st as well. Um, the last two novels were translated by Muhammad Taufi himself, so he has another hat, as you can see. Um, the first was published in English by AUC Press in 2008. Uh, that was Tifl um, Shai uh, and uh, in English translation, uh, he, uh, the author, decided on a new title. Therefore, the title in English is Murder in the Tower of Happiness. And um, uh, he also translated Fatet al-Halwa uh, in English, Candy Girl, uh, and it was published by AUC Press as well in 2012. Um, so... Mohammed Taufi, who has all of these hats, is today wearing yet another one, uh, which is that of translation. And his talk this evening is about self-translation. It's entitled Self-Translation, Faithful Rendition or Rewriting. So without faith, further ado, please help me welcome Mohammed Taufi. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, 
for that introduction, uh, particularly the uh, uh, description of uh, fascinatingly complex, <laughs> which is, is which can yeah. be tricky. Uh, Let me start by uh, an evening in Wellington, New Zealand. I was uh, thinking about, I was working on the translation of uh, the novel that uh, became translated in, in English later as uh, Murder in the Tower of Happiness. And I had a particular part that was I found very difficult to translate. And uh, I was walking, thinking about it, and then I, uh, uh, I just sat at a cafe in, in Wellington, um, all the time thinking, what's, what's the use of this translation? Why would anyone actually, outside of Egypt, outside the very narrow circumstances, very specific circumstances uh, that we're living in, be interested in reading this? And uh, I ordered a drink, and then uh, I asked the waitress uh, if, if uh, she had something uh, light, uh, a light snack. And she offered uh, right away uh, a steak and kidney pie. And I said, no, 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 something really light. And she said, I know exactly what you need. You need uh, an order of daika. And I said, what? She said, daika as though it was something I was supposed to know what, what, what it was. And, and you know, when you're in a strange land, you're usually a little bit sensitive about these issues. And so I was too embarrassed to, to ask her what it was. So I said, okay, Daika sounds fine. And, uh, and she got me uh, the order and I looked at it. Uh, and basically you had a, a, kind, of, uh, a kind of bread that was similar to our Samit, and next to it was Do'a. <laughs> and uh, of course, Do'a written in English would be D-O-K-A, Do'ka, and pronounced in, 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 in Kiwi would be Daika. Ah. And so, uh, which, is, which was exactly what I needed at, 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 at the time. It was the perfect thing, but uh, I started thinking that how this uh, dish had become incorporated in uh, 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 New Zealand culture without any difficulty. And I said, well, if they can consider, if this, if this waitress can consider uh, doka to be a, 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 uh, a New Zealand dish, then she can read my novel. Yeah. So I, I, uh, I worked on the, the translation. Uh, if we have time at the end, I'll read you that particular uh, extract. Um, it's uh, it, the, the, the issue of, of self-translation is a, a complicated issue. I mean, when, when I was writing my novels, it never occurred to me that I would be translating them one day. Uh, maybe if, if it had, I would have made things much, much simpler to translate. <laughs> but but at least it, 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 it was not something that I can say was inevitable. Uh, it's, it was something that happened through a process. So uh, the, the, the first part of that process was working with uh, translators who were not professionals, who translated texts of, of things, of, of, of stories and, and, and poems, and asked me to edit them. So the, the, the first step really was to edit what others had translated. Uh, and by doing the, the editing, I realized how complicated the process it was. Uh, it, 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 took, it, it was a sort of gradual process in which I started to understand how com complicated it was. And then gradually I started translating uh, some, some poems or short stories, uh, never novels, but, but uh, gradually I started to grasp the, the whole process. Uh, and when, uh, I, 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 at that point, I, I 
try to understand a little bit more about the whole process, how it was, how it was, how, what exactly was happening. And uh, I don't know if there's anyone here who is a, a fan of Star Trek. Uh, and I was watching, I don't watch a lot of television, but when I do, it's either Star Trek or, or Seinfeld. So uh, th there is, in, in, you know, in science fiction, there's this great, uh, uh, this great technology called uh, teleporting, which basically means you walk into uh, uh, a space and there's rotating lights on top of you, and you're transported from one point to another. So uh, you, 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 and, and there's, uh, Star Trek buffs have actually put together a whole scientific theory for it. So basically what happens is you walk into the, the transporter, and then the first thing that happens is that the computer uh, copies your pattern. So you become, with your memories, your body, everything about you becomes a pattern in the computer, in the system. And then the computer or the machine reduces you to your simplest components, which is presumably energy. And then that energy is moved to the other point, to the planet where you're going to land. And then uh, you are put back together according to that pattern. Um, and that seemed to sort of uh, uh, express what what I was seeing happening in in the in the translation process. You're really uh, uh, decomposing and then recomposing the, the the work. And of course, uh, you have these jokes, these comedies, these parodies of of Star Trek, in which there's a glitch in the system, and that person uh, is is uh, appears with their head looking back, their, their face looking backwards. Um, and uh, naturally, it, the, the, the question arises, can you replicate exactly that same person? Or are you actually killing that person and producing a reproduction or a clone of that person? And uh, if you reach the conclusion that it's impossible to actually uh, uh, reduce a person to energy and then put them back together, then another question arises. If you are going to recreate the person, if you're going to recreate, in our case, a, wor a work of art, uh, then why not improve it? It's, it's a logical conclusion. And for people who, are, uh, who follow Star Trek, there are a lot of Star Trek cartoons. And you have this cartoon in which a, uh, a prim officer, a lady with a ponytail, walks into the transporter, and then she arrives at the other side, and her hair is in a halo, a sexy halo around her. <laughs> and her breasts have expanded and have sort of uh, uh, ruptured her uniform. Um, visually, it's, it's beautiful, actually. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's very interesting. But it, it shows the idea that, okay, if you are going to use this, if you're going to have this transformation, why not make it sexier? And uh, since I, m m most of my life I've spent outside of Egypt. Uh, on many occasions, I have uh, had a look at uh, books, Egyptian works in translation. And uh, some of them I had read in Arabic. And I could see that uh, actually they read better, particularly when you're looking at it from the perspective of a Western person. If that translation had been literal, it, it, would, have, it would have not made any sense at all. So, Improvements happen, improvements happen in making the, the new creature more adaptable to its environment, but they also happen in areas such as editing, because 
in, in Arabic literature, we almost ne don't have editors. We have sometimes good publishers, they have someone who will make sure the grammar is all right. But, but editors in the traditional sense, we, ju we just don't have. And when you read these translated novels, they are edited. So the translator has not only acted as a translator, as somebody who, who has really recreated the, the work, but also someone who has edited that work. And uh, you, can, you can also make that work more attractive to the particular reader you, you have in mind. So, so this is basically uh, what you have is a new product. And as a writer, you have to take that into consideration. When someone, if your work is going to be translated by someone else, you have to take that into consideration. You, you have to accept that sort of risk. Uh, so, so basically, what, what, what you're, you're not just translating the language. You're not just translating the culture. You're translating way of thinking. You've, you're translating a value system from one value system to another. Um, and there's still a more complicated process because what you're, translate, you're translating uh, is not something that is common to a particular culture. You're translating the particular work of a particular writer that is distinct and different from the particular work of every other writer and that comes from an internal world that is, is a creation uh, of its own. And uh, yesterday I was mentioning that Samuel Beckett considered this process. Sa Samuel Beckett is particularly important mm -hmm. when discussing this issue of, of self-translating. So uh, Beckett considered that it's a dual process. The first process is the artist searching in his soul for the work. And the second part is the artist translating what he has found in his soul in a language that can be read by others. So you have the artist and the artisan uh, working together in this process. So uh, it's, it's, it's a long process. And when you are basically the, uh, the, the author of, of the work, you uh, uh, have to accept that risk. So the, the question then arises, is it worth the, the time, the energy that, that you are going to put in, in that work just to preserve what you consider to be uh, your unique work? Or actually, isn't it a good idea to have someone make your work a little bit sexier? It's, it's a it's a it's a, it's a legitimate it's a legitimate question. So when when you are considering these issues, uh, definitely writers who choose to translate their own work, they do so because they need to control the whole process. But in, in my view, that's not enough. In my view, if it was just about this issue of control, uh, we would not have had Samuel Beckett do all that translating that he did. Uh, the, the, there must be something else. There must be something that is related to the writing itself, to the writing process itself. And uh, when, when we're talking about uh, Beckett in particular, uh, the, the, he, he not only translated his own work, or a lot of his own work, but also he wrote a lot of his own work in a foreign language, in a language that was not, was not his native language, in French. And the, the part, what is considered his mature work, was the point when he started to write in French. And he did not do so because uh, he woke up one morning and said, okay, Let's try writing in French. He did so because he reached a conclusion that 
the writing itself, the product is different uh, when written in different languages. And in, in, in my case, uh, I felt that, and I'll give you concrete examples. Uh, and I think it's very relevant to the, to the translation issue. Um, I wrote w one story uh, originally in English. It's about a, uh, basically about a man and a woman in a restaurant. They're having lunch, um, they're talking, and you can see a relationship building up between them. Because I wrote it in English, when you read it, all you find is this man, this woman, and the table in front of them with the different types of food. Uh, and you can have this focus on the relationship. Very simple, very direct. Now, I tried to write a similar story in Arabic about a young couple, a man, his wife, and their young child, who is stuck in traffic, in Cairo traffic. Uh, also as a way of exploring the relationship between the couple, which was at a particularly difficult time. Uh, but when the story came out, because it was written in Arabic, it was not just about the couple and the relationship between them and their son. It was about the whole society, about the noise that was coming in through the windows, about the pollution, uh, about what was happening in the country. So this invasiveness uh, was impossible for me to avoid. So language comes with its own baggage. You cannot sort of disinfect language. You cannot uh, isolate it from the culture that produced it. Uh, and that, that takes me back to the, 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 the issue of, of self-translating. Uh, when, when we're talking about a particular uh, work, uh, translating a work, uh, basically we, we are focusing on that work. It's like um, you have two travelers going along their paths and they meet at an inn and they have a conversation and then each of them continues on their way. Um, but each traveler has a whole journey. And the writer does not focus exclusively on, on this work, but sees this work as part of a journey, as part of a, of, of a whole process. And that's where self-translation makes a difference. Because you get to re-examine your work using different eyes, using the eyes of a different culture. You see your work itself differently. And that will inevitably influence the next work that you will be, uh, you will be creating. Uh, to, 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 to make this idea a little bit more concrete, um, right now I'm thinking about exploring my next novel. And what I'd really like to write is a novel that sounds and reads like a first novel. Uh, now how can you do that with uh, a 30, year gap uh, with, my, with, 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 the, with my first, with my actual first novel. Well, you can do things like, I, I, I was just reading and rereading Nagib Mahfouz's first novel. Uh, but, but that's not enough. Uh, and I decided the best thing to do was to translate my first novel, uh, which is in, 
incredibly difficult to translate. But, but I thought that looking at it from a different angle, from a new, from a completely different perspective of another language, another culture, uh, I may find out something about what is unique about a first novel. And maybe I will try to, uh, to replicate that in, in the coming one. Uh, before concluding and opening up uh, for, for a discussion, uh, I would like to read you the part that I was working on in New Zealand when that lady bee got me the door. Is that okay? Absolutely. <laughs> I'll read the Arabic first. قول لي يا دكتور بصفتك عالم من علماء الغيبيات على مستوى مصر وامريكا كمان امتى السماء تكون بتنجاني ابتسامه عريضه ارتسمت على وجه بسيل المتكور يحتل وحده كنبه بنفسجيه اللون مجاوره لعبد الملاك باهتمام بالغ يترقب رده في الفجرية يقول عبد الملاك بحذر مدركا أن المسألة فيها أفشة في الفجرية سما بتكون برتقاني جرى يا دكتور أنت ما بتصليش الفجر ولا إيه يجلس الرجل وساقها قصيرتان مفتوحتان على آخر برج الهمة اتخذت هيئته تحت بدلته البيضاء المهرولة ورباط عنقه المشجر الأحمر في أخضر شكل كرتين ضخمتين الأولى والأكبر هي برميل جذعه والثانية الأصغر هي الكرة التي أذهلت عبد الملاك في موضعها في حجر بنطلونه يحاول تجنب أن يتخيل مما عساها أن تتكون من بين أعضاء جسد الرجل يبقى في المغربية السأم يتسلل إلى صوت عبد الملاك يريد أن يصيح غلوب حماري لا يا دكتور لما الدنيا تكون مسقعة يرتج برميل الجلي الذي هو صاحب المألاة عبد الله بسيلي في صمت لجزء من الثانية قبل أن يجرفه بركان من الضحك يكتاح القاع فينجح حيث فشل الجوني ووكر بلاك ليبل في مد خطوط الاتصال بين الحاضرين الذين فصلت بينهم محيطات السن والمال والتعليم والخلفية الاجتماعية لم تربطهم سوى دعوة الفنانة الألمعية لولا حمدي <تصفيق> Now let's read the English tra translation uh, I'm not going to comment on the difference Basili sits with his short legs wide apart beneath his shapeless white suit and red and green necktie, his body is composed of two spheres. The biggest is the barrel of his torso, but it is the smaller one between the man's legs that leaves Adel Malek dumbfounded. He tries to avoid visualizing which of the man's organs it may be. Tremors shake the jelly barrel of a man a split second before the volcano of his laughter erupts. His joke succeeds with the Johnny Walker black label has failed in melting the ice between guests divided by the oceans of age, wealth, education, and class with only one thing in common, an invitation from the colorful artist, Lula Hamdi. That's it, thank you. Rewriting indeed. 
thank you. It's a, it's a great, uh, it's a great uh, a passage. Mm-hmm. I didn't. Shala, <laughs> rewriting. You know. It's all gone, all of the dialogue. Yeah, yeah. That the dialogue is deleted in the English translation. It's, not, it's simply not there. Um, thank you so much uh, for this um, very thoughtful um, talk about a very complex uh, process. Uh, and uh, we, I expect there are questions and comments. Zina, go ahead. Thank you very much. That was really interesting. I'm always interested as a translator and a writer to know whether one can translate one's own work. I've often thought it was difficult. And uh, I think you've proved uh, what I thought. It is difficult. It's very difficult. And actually, I was going to ask about the Ilmise. Actually, I was going to ask. Obviously, it's such an Egyptian, it, it's a pun and a, a play on words that it would be extremely, it would be impossible to translate it into English. But you didn't think of making up a new joke to get the same effect. I'm asking because this is what I do when I'm translating something that has a joke. I just look at the effect that it had on me and I try to find a similar kind of joke that would produce the same effect. You didn't think of doing that? Uh, well, I mean, I, I, I particularly chose this, this part to show that when you are really translating your own work, you have a little bit more freedom. Uh, I did, of course, think of, of, of a few jokes that would have made sense in English. But I felt that they would be out of place. And if, if, if I had read a larger part, uh, it flows fine. Because this is a guy who's making jokes, cracking jokes all the time. So you don't need to translate every single joke. You can just have one joke, and then you know, the, the reader will understand that this is the guy who's, who's cracking jokes all the time. But, but obviously, if I was translating someone else's work, I would have uh, made a greater effort to, to sort of include an, an, another joke, yeah. yeah. Thank you. I have a question. Is there a question? Um, I'm interested in this idea of making things sexier, right? <laughs> sexier from whose point of view? I mean, it seems to me that as you were speaking, you were uh, speaking about making it sexier from your own perspective. I mean, that you are making a decision on what is or might be sexier as you carry it across to another language. How do you know uh, uh, then that your the recipient, the interlocutor, will actually find your choice sexy? Yeah. I think that's, that, that, that's a brilliant question. I, I wasn't really referring to myself doing the translation. I was, I was saying in general. Mm. Uh, and I wasn't thinking in terms of uh, just the translator. I was thinking of the, of the publishing process. Mm. Uh, because obviously what you're going to, uh, uh, w- w- when you're translating a work, you are going to be interested in the market. Mm-hmm. And if, if if you do this professionally, you have to understand what the market needs, mm-hmm. the kind of product that the market will will uh, basically will need. Uh, but also d- during the editing mm-hmm. process, the editor will make it very clear what is what is sexier. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, to a certain extent, this happens even in when you're writing the original text. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, uh, the, 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 the publisher will always tell you, well, this part, uh, it's too long, it's too boring, or, or this part, uh, can you expand a little bit here? I mean, the, this, this, this thing does go on. There is, at the end of the day, you, you have a, an artistic process, 
and then that's followed by a marketing process and uh, uh, an industry. And, and that industry certainly has very specific ideas about what the market, uh, what, what is sexier and what the market needs. I have, I often have differences of view with the publishers. Mm -hmm. I think they're wrong. Mm -hmm. But of course, uh, uh, they have, they have uh, uh, the evidence is all on their side. Really. Mm -hmm. But then you have a question. Um, first of all, I really like the, the Candy Girl. I read it in Arabic, so I don't know <laughs> if, if the translation is. But um, the, the translation you just gave, it's, it uh, makes me question what is the definition of a translation from the point of view of me, the recipient. Because um, I would imagine that in a language that I can't speak, in, for example, if I'm, try I'm reading Paulo Coelho from Portuguese or Spanish, when he try writes, um, I, I'm imagining or I'm expecting, my expectation is what his original work was like, what it, the way it was received. Um, the, the Arabic part, the Arabic uh, story that you gave had a joke, it had a uh, it had a very different structure for me, for me as a reader of a short story. The English was, for me, it's, it, for you, the author, you felt that it was the same, it, it gave the same effect. But for me, the, the reader, I didn't feel that it was a translation. I would have felt cheated, sort of, if I knew that this is what I received and the original text was different. So I would like to ask you, what is your definition of a translation? Why do you think that this is the translation of the work. Even though the English part was great, but the idea of the translation, for me, the recipient who doesn't know the original text. Thank you. I think, I think, I think that's a perfectly valid point. Um, we would all love to speak all languages and we'd all love to read uh, the, the texts in the original. That's, that's that, but, but, Basically, what, what I see, the process of translation. I mean, for example, if you're translating from Arabic, if you're writing the original Arabic text, if you don't say the same thing three, different, th three times in three different ways, mm. the reader will not feel satisfied. He will not feel that you're writing with enough conviction. Now, when you translate that into English, immediately, you, f you, you, you say, why, why are you repeating the same thing three times? So there's, you, you cannot. You cannot physically translate something uh, uh, as it is. Um, it, w w what matters is to have a new text that the reader in that language can read and enjoy. Um, and, and you have to make decisions. And you have to make choices and, and, and so on. Um, this is an extreme case. I chose it because it's an extreme case, uh, but but it it is in in, in you know uh, in, in in some cases you have to make these these decisions and it's important to distinguish between what is central to uh, the theme and and what is not, and this is basically the choice uh, I made. If I had, I could have I could have thought of a joke. I I, I did think of, a, of of three or four jokes, different options. But I felt it, I felt the, 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 there's always something that's going to be lost. I felt the least damage was keeping it this way. But also something that is gained, if I may add, Yanni. And it's never just loss. It's very difficult and to this is one text, and this is one story, and this is another story for me. No, it's not another story. It's, a, it's another original. And that's what a translation is. You know, a translation is not a copy. It's another original. Mm -hmm. And I, I think even if uh, Muhammad had kept the entire text there, it would have still been a very different text. It is not identical. It's never a copy, as, mm -hmm. as he just said. So I, 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 I think the, whether the joke is there or not there is not the, the issue. The issue is that tra a translation is not a copy. 
and will never be identical. Um, the, the passage you just read is a drastic change, and I think you have the right to because it's your work. But if it's um, if it's somebody else translating your work and he would do the same, how would you feel about that? Well, th 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 first of all, you you are uh, uh, giving one of the reasons why I translate my own work. <laughs> Uh, but 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 I, I, I actually I would appreciate it if if I had the choice if I had if we, if, if we had a discussion I mean the, 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 if we had a discussion about uh, about it because obviously uh, there are languages I don't speak I mean most languages in the world I don't speak so um, actually having this sort of discussion I think in itself would 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 be valuable uh, but at the end of the day. You, you, you have to accept that th this is a new work that basically uh, is, is based on, of course, of, on the original work, but it's a new work, it's a new work that has a new life, a new spirit. Uh, it's never exactly the same, the same soul. Uh, so, uh, at the end of the day of that um, um, discussion, <laughs> what would be, what is, that, what is that central thing that would connect the original work and the translated one? And the, when you decide that you translate for your, for your own, it's your own work, so you know exactly what you want to communicate. So it's, this is uh, somehow philosophical, of course. So, I mean, it depends. Uh, uh, from my point of view, it's better that you translate your own work because it's the way you see it. It's the, your, your own thought. That's what I want to tell the, the world, what, how I see this situation or how I... Um, uh, I conceive it. So, what do you think about that? Well, th 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 thank you very much. I, I certainly uh, uh, agree with with what you said. But le let me just mention something. There is a time gap between the time you're actually writing and the original work, and the time when you're at, when you're translating it. And that time gap is not small. So you're not really the same person who wrote it when you're doing the translation. You've already moved on. Uh, your thoughts have moved on. Uh, and, 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 and that's uh, uh, another dimension to, uh, to the issue. Now, in, in my case, I definitely have a, a theme that I'm writing about. Uh, but the way I write is I try to write around the central point. I don't deal directly with the central issue. And I'll give you an example, uh, because it's a story I think uh, uh, maybe uh, most people here haven't read. Um, there was, in uh, the 1990s, an attack, an Israeli attack, on a Palestinian refugee camp in Lebanon called Qana. And I wanted to write a story about that, about Qana. And the story I wrote was this. You have this young Egyptian who thinks he's really cool, and he goes to a resort somewhere in the country to have some fun. And when he arrives at the hotel, he goes down to the lobby, the television is on, you have a video clip of, of, of uh, people singing and dancing, and then someone turns the television and they got the news, and then the news very briefly says there has been an Israeli attack on the Palestinian camp in Kana. And this guy says, ah, oh, 
I was just going to start having fun. I'm not going to order my drink. This is going to be boring. So he goes, so he leaves the, the lobby and he goes to the swimming pool and he relaxes there, orders his drink, and there's a nice uh, young woman in a bikini and uh, he says, oh, she, she looks nice. And uh, later on he moves, he, he remembers he needs to make a phone call. That was, of course, back in the 90s. People didn't have cell phones. So he goes to the, uh, to the, uh, the switch, the, 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 the telephone switch where they had, the, and, and he's, he, he stands in line there, and he finds that this woman is ahead of him in line. So he says, this is a good opportunity. He starts uh, striking conversation with her, introducing himself, telling her about the great parties that he organizes, how much fun he is, and so on. And she's distracted. She listens to him, but she's very distracted. She's, she, she responds, and he, he, he realizes that she's Lebanese from her accent. So it's, it's her turn uh, uh, before him. She gets to make her phone call, and then uh, she, she says, she asks the operator to call her, give this number, it's in Kana. And, the, uh, and then he watches as her face turns blue. He doesn't know exactly what's happening, but she's becoming, she's, she looks very depressed. And then he thinks to himself, oh, no, no, this girl is too gloomy. Let's go look for someone else, and he leaves. That's the story. So this is, this is how, if you look, this is how I, I write. I don't deal with the central issue. I write around it. Uh, and th that makes the translation trickier. Because it's, it's the, the, whole, the whole basically text is about hints. Uh, you, you don't have this, this uh, you can't put your hand on something and say it. And then the other issue is, I don't really believe that I have a particular message that I want to relay to the reader. Uh, I have a certain feeling. Uh, I, I, I feel that this issue is important. But it's up to the reader really to make up their minds what they're thinking, how they're feeling about it. Do we have a question? Okay, I was just... Um Interested to know more about your current project of revisiting your first novel and translating it. And I was also curious to know why you feel the urge or the need to write uh, like your first novel, uh, like an author's first novel. It's very interesting. Well, uh, you, you want to know about my first novel. My first novel is uh, 550 pages long. It, it covers, basically it's about a family. It has the patriarch, who's a rich man, who's married to two women. And uh, then you have the children and so on. Uh, the first wife was uh, an aristocrat and she was born on the 1st of January, uh, 1900. And the second wife, who was a farm girl, was uh, born later, but in, a, in the next novel in the trilogy, she dies on the 31st of January, 1999. So basically, you have a century of Egypt and what's happening in, in, in Egypt. And when I started translating the novels, first of all, rereading it and then translating it, I had expected to find a sort of naive, optimistic work. Um, I hadn't obviously read it since the 1990s when, when it was, uh, when, I, when, when the final draft was given to the publisher. So I had expected in my mind's eye that this novel would be a sort of naive, happy 
uh, novel. And what I found was a novel that was extremely cruel. From the first page, an extremely vicious novel. Um, and uh, I'm still trying to work out, I'm, I'm coming to your second question, why is it important to try write and write the first novel again? Uh, maybe I'm getting old. Uh, but, but, but there's always something special about a first novel, like a first love. It's always something unique. And it would be good if you could combine that spirit, uh, that thirst for life, with experience. If you could put, put them together and see what, what it would lo look like. But I haven't figured out how to do that yet, unfortunately. <laughs> There's a question right behind you, Neda. Right. No. It's really a, a comment um, on what you were saying earlier. In a sense, I mean, you talked about the distance, the, the time between writing the novel and translating it, and you're a different person, and so on and so forth. And you have the freedom to transform things far more than another translator would. So one might assume that another translator, if he or she is a good one, might produce a translation which is, in fact, more faithful to the original work than the one you produce perfectly legitimately, I mean, however many years later. Not really a question, just a comment. But also, if I may follow up on that, I mean, many works have several translations. I mean, you know, it doesn't have to be just one. And then readers can just pick and choose, I suppose, and, and com compare. It places the reader in a position of privilege, actually, when, you know, you can, uh, you can have several versions of the original uh, work. Of course, I think one of, one of the famous translations that have changed is that of uh, Rubaiyat, Omar al Khayyam. Enormous difference in, in translations make an enormous difference in meaning. Yeah. I wanted to ask you about uh, humor. I think any self translation in your case, uh, in the case of your works, uh, is complicated even further by the fact that they are satirical, you know, and that they sort of submerge us in, the, in a very sort of localized and local kind of humor. And um, what do you do in order to carry across uh, that? Because I really think satire and humor are perhaps the most difficult uh, to carry across. And I think of a character like Ishawish uh, Ashmuni, uh, and every, I mean, his consciousness, you know, how he thinks and the things he, uh, how he articulates stuff to, to himself and the kinds of dreams that he has that are so very Ishawish uh, Ashmuni and would not be a Captain uh, Tom or John or any, you know, it would just be so very different. So, what do you do? Because well, you have also a lo lot of detail, yeah, yeah. and you just love uh, the nitty gritty of the, the funny. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Well, I mean, in, in the case Shem uh, Shawish Ashmuni, for example, there was a, uh, a part in which he's making, he's, he's, a traffic, he's a traffic policeman. So he spends all day in traffic. And of course, he's poor, and these guys are passing in their rich, these rich people in their fancy cars. So he's making private jokes about each car. Uh, so basically you have about a page or a page or, uh, and a half. Things happening, but in between he's making these jokes about the cars. And uh, that took a long time, of course. So with each, with each passing car, I'd give three or four different options and then I'd weigh them and you know, but it was impossible to do what I did here. I could not have omitted them because basically right. the whole thing would have been. So it's now the, the challenge is, is bigger in the current novel, I'm trying to, the first novel, 
because that is a novel that is full full of humor mm. it's based i mean the 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 murder in the tower of happiness is a crime and candy girl is in a, a, a spy novel mm. the 550 pages of uh, of tutu is are basically about humor mm. the, the the weight is carried by humor so it's it's going to be a challenge that's why it's so difficult to translate mm. in addition to songs it has songs it has uh, pieces from television ads it has uh, you know it's so it's 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 uh, definitely going to be a challenge and it's going to take a long time to to do but of course, but we, we we'll find out really so i Now what I can add, please. Uh, I, I want to know what's, uh, what's hard, the hardest uh, to translate uh, a major uh, uh, specific uh, action in, in society you want to translate in, in a different, uh, uh, to a different uh, so, uh, society or, um, or the, the, or the, Uh, the sense of humor in, in a certain novel uh, you want to translate in, in, uh, in, in another way. What's different, the actions or the humor? Okay. Um, obviously, uh, as you said, the, 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 the novel is happening in society. There's a social context. Uh, and uh, <coughs> th there are characters, there are people. And the, 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 what carries any, any work of drama is the people, the characters. Uh, and you, you can put these characters in difficult situations and their reactions reveal who they are. It's, it's a much better method than describing, saying that person is selfish or that person. It's much better to put them in these tests Like you, you have in, at university, you go, you go to a test and they, they can you know, basically uh, weigh you through, through, through your reactions. And so you, you put these characters, but these characters are not floating in, the spa in space. They are part of a social order. And uh, you have to take that into account. Uh, but, but at the end of the day, if, if uh, these tests happen to be related to a murder, or they're related to, to spies who are out there to kill you, or they're related to something happening uh, in virtual reality. All these are details. But the fundamentals of the story are really the people and who these, who, who these people are. I have one more question, Alicia, and I'll answer this. <laughs> um, actually, we started this semester with a lecture on co-translation. You know, um, co-translation, um, and it was a lecture by uh, Dr. Fadia Razul, who had um, been collaborating actually on more than one work with uh, John Verlander, who is an Amer American colleague who used to work at AUC and has left uh, recently. And they, and they worked together on Edward al Kharat's Rama with Tinin, you know, and then of late on Leila wal Majnoon by Palestinian, um, I'm sorry, I think he's uh, Kuwaiti. I think he's Kuwaiti, Kuwaiti writer. I forget his name. <coughs> anyway, so my question to you is, have you ever considered co-translation as a possibility? whereby you could be more uh, faithful, you know, to your, your, your own text, actually, at the end of the day. Well, uh, I started mentioning that I started translating, basically, someone else would do the translation, I would do the editing. So that's, that's partly a, a, a co-translation. Mm. Uh, but the... Are you thinking, I mean, uh, if, if, if you, you, you said Edward Harrat. How do you translate Edward Harrod? It's it's a it's a it's a monumental task. Yeah, it's not an easy task. Right. How do you translate uh, James Joyce into yeah. Arabic? Yeah, yeah. 
It's a monumental task. So it, it makes sense with, with these kinds of works uh, that you have two different people. Uh, and different one sensibilities. Native, one exactly. is an academic and the other is a poet, yeah. actually. Yeah. Yeah. And having, having these, it, it, it makes a lot of sense. Mm. Otherwise, for one person to do it, it would take 10 years mm. to, do it, uh, to, to do it correctly. So, yeah. so, so definitely, uh, if, if these two people can work together well, mm. I think it's, it's something that's worthwhile doing. Mm. Any more questions, comments? Okay. Well, thank you very much for a wonderful evening and, uh, you know, very interesting issues that you raised and responded to. And good luck with your first novel. <laughs> thank you very much.